Today we're going to talk about Wi-Fi network design, 10 essentials, and uh, yeah, let's get started. It's kind of ironic though that the guy with the thickest accent gets to speak at the governor's ballroom. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is what it is though, right? So um, my name is Jussi, uh, I come from Finland, and uh, this, is, this is what we do back there, and there's a reason why we're here in Nashville and not, not back there, so. Uh, any, anyways, I work, disclaimer, I do work for a vendor, we make Wi-Fi network design tools, so, so there will be some brainwashing here and there, but I'll try to keep it to a minimum, okay? I've been working with Wi-Fi network design since 2002 and with Wi-Fi since 2001, but I'm no Chuck Lukaszewski, so, so don't expect this to be, you know, that technical. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Anybody here on Twitter? Good. Uh, and those, those of you that are not, you should go there if you're into Wi-Fi. All the latest information is there first. Uh, so that's me when I joined Ekahau, so you can see what happens when you work with Wi-Fi for <laughs> 15 years or so. And uh, somewhere in between, there was a transition phase that, where I looked like this, so. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so yeah, Twitter's really important. Find me on LinkedIn, whatever. Um, so today we're gonna talk about beer and Wi-Fi, if that's okay with you guys. And um, so we'll kind of try to explain 10 essential tips for designing really good quality Wi-Fi. And if you're, if you're already highly technical and know this stuff, maybe this will help you explain the basic Wi-Fi concepts to your customers. So hope, you know, both very technical and semi-technical people will get something out of this. And then, actually at the end, I think I'll save it at the end, to the end, but we will have some, uh, some like live demo of, of what exactly were those 10 uh, essentials all about, if you don't mind. If you, you, you can skip, skip those if you want. And then at the end, we'll also have a q and A Q&A, if, if there's time permitting. I think I have like, a, was it one hour 15 scheduled, out of which we've used 10 minutes. So, so uh, I think we're good for all of this. Well, not really true, because you know, if we get this, then you know, we won't get anywhere. So let's save the questions at the end, to, until the end, if it's okay. Um, so the idea why we're here is so that we do not deploy this, right? So <laughs> what's wrong with the picture? Nothing, exactly. It's, it's Aruba, right? So, so it's perfect. Yeah, it's perfectly R RF shielded back there. And uh, same thing here, uh, kind, kind of same stuff. And that, what is that? That's a hidden SSID, right? Because it's hidden behind the, uh, the shelf. And then there's, you know, all kinds of funky antenna placements to get you going. And this guy, who tucked him to bed? And <laughs> pretty cool. And then uh, one of my favorites, you know all, all this about you know, Wi-Fi radiation, it's, it's hurting me and my family and my kids. Well, you can, there's something you can do about it, right? <laughs> and uh, pu put it to the oven and let it bake for 30 minutes and it's done, right? And um, don't credit me for the photos though. Uh, go to badfi.com and uh, Eddie Ferreira hosts a site where you know, people post their Badfi installation, so badfi.com. Don't go there now, because you'll be distracted from the super cool presentation. But go there after, okay? Cool. And yeah, one, one more, how's that? <laughs> Anyways. So, back to the agenda. Setting up a Wi-Fi network is actually like, to me, I, I was trying to think this, and then it occurred to me that it is actually like setting up a bar, really. And, um, for both Wi-Fi and a bar have a lot of lot in common, right? So in a bar, you have bartenders. And with Wi-Fi, you have access points. Okay, so far so good. Then uh, in the bar, you have clients. And with Wi-Fi, you have client devices. And what is really the goal of a bartender? Serve. Serve, exactly, to serve, to get that wine going from that bottle to that glass. That's really what it is, right? And what's the purpose of Wi-Fi? Serve the clients. So the same thing, 
just, you know, instead of wine, ones and zeros are being transmitted back and forth. So pretty simple stuff, actually, if you think about it. However, just like with bars, this is really easy to set up. Anyone can pretty much set up a bar where you, you know, serve one customer at a time, uh, you know, some artisan beer that you bought from somewhere. That's, that's not really high capacity. So that's, that's pretty easy to set up. And that's what I would call also home Wi-Fi. You know, Wi-Fi gets a bad name in enterprises because people are like, well, at my home it works perfectly, but at my enterprise it kind of sucks, or at the hotel it kind of sucks, or at the stadium. It's because of this. You know, it's very easy to set up a scenario like this, but, so, so you know, that's what I would call it, piece of cake, right? Home Wi-Fi, piece of cake. As long as you have coverage, you're usually good. Unless you have like 18 kids, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm sure Angelina, Jolie, and Brad Pitt are running into these high capacity scenarios, but, but you know, any, anybody else, probably not. So this then is high capacity. And this is where the problems start, both in the bar and with Wi-Fi. You have lots of clients, lots of APs, high data demand. That's your typical sucky hotel Wi-Fi, stadium Wi-Fi, whatnot. So. You better wake up, man. I hear your alarm. Just, just so that uh, what is outside the scope of this presentation is going to be wired Ethernet. So, so, you know, putting yourself straight to the tap and, and drinking from there. So we're going to, this is outside the scope, okay? So, which leads us to tip number two. And this is pretty simple stuff, but this is the most fundamental rule. You should pay some attention to design. Because usually when people design Wi-Fi, they do it like this. So they spend very, it's very attractive uh, for both of us selling Wi-Fi equipment and both of us buying Wi-Fi equipment and installing it to make, you know, the requirements gathering and, and planning and designing really quickly. But then you run into this endless, you know, loop of crying end users, right? So that's what I would call the very later approach. And because I'm in the business of Wi-Fi design tools, so I may, might be slightly biased, but this is kind of what I'm trying to go for as well. So, you know, spend some more time when you're designing the network appropriately, and then, you know, you can be chilling most of the time. And I did interview a year or two ago, some of you may know, for example, Lee Badman. I, um, he's a network architect at Syracuse. I interviewed him and, and like 20 other network owners who own decent-sized Wi-Fi networks. And they, th that's where this idea actually came from. And Lee said it well that I have designed my network myself. I know the infrastructure works 99% of the time. So w when come troubleshooting call, I pretty much know it's going to be the client so I can directly troubleshoot the client. And that was a pretty powerful message to me. Anyways, so it doesn't come easy though, uh, and it doesn't come free. So if we talk, talk about you know, properly designing and setting up a Wi-Fi network, there's all these phases you know, from planning to validation, troubleshooting, monitoring, and, and there's, there's stuff that you need to do in order to make good Wi-Fi, in order to make Wi-Fi work, not just with a couple of clients, but with a decent number of clients. So, so there's stuff that I would, you know, recommend at least considering if you're not doing this today. Which leads us to tip number three. So what kind of blueprints do you usually get to put into your airwave or to do your designs on? Crap. There you go, crap. The four letter word that's generally acceptable. I like that. Um, so, so blueprint quality has a direct correlation with Wi-Fi design efficiency and the speed. So what you want really, ultimately, is CAD drawings. And I'll, you know, I'll show you briefly on how, how this actually works if you haven't seen it later on. But it's just like getting the scale automatically of the drawing, getting the walls automatically uh, in place. Who here has drawn walls when you're doing Wi-Fi design? Who here loves that? Who, who here <laughs> won? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's billable hours, but as Wi-Fi engineers, as Wi-Fi architects, not necessarily what we should do. We should probably be doing something, you know, a bit more challenging, most of the time anyways. So, uh, 
make sure, if possible, get those CAD drawings. And actually, one very big systems integrator guy uh, did not, no, not, not a big guy, a guy who works for a pretty big systems integrator. Um, he said that, you know, they, are st they started to charge their customers significant amounts of extra if they don't get good blueprints in CAD format. So there's two prices, depending on whether you have CAD drawings or not. Anyways, and there's, there's a few other essentials as well. Whether you get CAD drawings or not, you know, you, you want them, first of all, blueprints up to date. So when you're doing your site survey, you're not, you know, bouncing in off of walls just because it was built after the blueprint was made or, you know, white backgrounds, high resolution, things like that. Maybe, maybe here could be a list that you could send to your, you know, end customer that, you know, uh, here are some of the requirements that I want you guys to fulfill the next time you ask for the blueprints. And it's pretty often that we, you know, we just go on site and we haven't even received the blueprints yet. And then the first phase is, you know, spend four hours of the first day just hunting for blueprints. And then you get crap. So, moving on to tip number three. When it comes to high efficiency Wi-Fi, the number one thing you need to worry about is data rates. And why is that? So you need to just get the clients on and off the network quickly, and let's see why. First of all, when you're entering the network, well, this is pretty basic stuff. So to, to enter the network, authenticate, associate, whatnot, first of all, you want the clients to be at high signal strength and not at the end of the bar. That's, that's a problematic, because the bartender, who isn't even in sight, has probably you know, problems hearing you. So go close to the bartender, have the clients be close to the access points, as close as possible, so that you get uh, you know, decent speed, decent signal strength and SNR. So all you need to do is you know, high signal strength and show your ID, so, so uh, authenticate to the network, right? And the deal, uh, I'm not saying get high data rates and go close to the access point. I'm not saying it because the Aruba guys told me to because they make more money the more APs they sell. It's, it's not that. It's that just like in a bar, you know, in a bar, a servant serves or a bartender serves one customer at any given time. With Wi-Fi, it's the exact same thing. Although we experience, you know, 30 clients connected to an AP and, and everything seems to be happening simultaneously, it's really not. It's one guy talking at a time. It's one of those 30 clients, or it's the AP. Just one guy talks at one time. And the quicker the first client talks, the quicker the next client can join and talk, you know, do his stuff, and so on. So it's an enormously uh, fast process where clients and access points take turns in order to get their stuff done. That's why, and the higher the data rate is, the quicker the clients can do their business. So, that's why high data rate is critical, and data rate usually, it's just a combination of signal strength, SNR, something like that. So, you know, if I had to name one metric, you need good signal to noise ratio to get good data rates. Get those clients to talk and then be quiet. Talk and then be quiet, as quickly as possible. So what contributes to this low data rate or low SNR? Just like in a bar, there can be a lot of noise. So as your SNR drops. In Wi-Fi, it's obviously, you know, Bluetooth, microwave ovens, wireless video cameras, whatnot. And then there's, at times, there's, you know, some channel interference, so fighting. AP is fighting to take turns. And then, you know, some, some of the clients may have <laughs> lower capabilities than others. So, in a nutshell, we've spent a good 25 minutes. What have we learned so far? Pop quiz. Why is this guy unhappy? Precisely, precisely. So, these women here, they have high data, right? So look, look, see how happy they are. Ooh, I'm enjoying 64 Quam. And these guys, 
they're generating high noise levels to the guy, so you know, he's experiencing low signal strength and very low SNR. That's pretty much what we learned so far, right? So, tip number four, related again to the previous. All Wi-Fi clients are not equal in terms of performance. So first of all, who do we not let in to a bar? Yeah. Exactly. So no kids, no intoxicated adults. And similarly to your Wi-Fi, not everybody should be allowed in. So to maximize the airtime to get the clients on and off the network quickly, disable legacy client access. If you don't have legacy clients, disable those and disable low, low data rates in general. Do an inventory of your clients that are associated to your network and see if there's any legacy clients out there. And if there is, can you actually you know, remove them from the equation one way or the other? I know it costs a few bucks to replace those clients, but the TC, the total cost of ownership might be actually pretty much lower in replacing the clients than all the other clients suffering because you, you, you need to support these two devices from 1984. So in short, this guy is called Mr. 802.11b, right? <laughs> Not allowed. So disabling low data rates. Let's take a look. Like, you know in bar, when, when people pay with pennies and, and, and you have to wait for your turn, that's exactly what, what's happening here. So, so if you have low data rates, everybody else has to wait for their turn. It's like paying with pennies. And then there's other differences between uh, client devices as well. Efficiency. So pouring one drink at a time, one spatial stream client. So just one data stream at any given time in any space. Now this, so this is your mobile phone, not utilizing all the capabilities of the IP, and this is your laptop, let's say, you know, your MacBook, three by three MIMO, so three spatial streams, meaning it gets its job done quicker. Data rates correlate directly with the number of spatial streams. You have one stream, let's say you have 50 megs data rate, you have two streams, you have 100 megs. It's just very efficient. So what is this then? MU MIMO, right? Multi-user MIMO. So, so we can, you, you know, serve multiple clients at the same time, right? <laughs> A highly technical explanation. So the good thing when you consider the capacity of the Wi-Fi network, you know when you're doing your capacity planning for this, this size of conference room, and then you're like, the customer is like, yeah, it fits 414 people, and uh, they might be using YouTube high definition, so it's 414 people, all of which are using YouTube high definition at the same time, so now make it work. And you're like, it's impossible. It's, it's just impossible, but it's also not a very likely scenario. Not all of you have already dosed off and went to YouTube and, and, and watched your favorite, you know, YouTubers or whatever they are called. I'm not young enough to understand that. But <laughs> anyway, so, so the positive thing is not all the client devices that are in the network are transmitting at the same time. Not all of them are even connected to the network. You do, however, want them connected in the network so they're not probing, but they're not transmitting at the same time. So, just like here, right? See this guy? Access, again, access point is the bartender. This guy, he's clearly idle. He's processing the data that he's previously <laughs> transmitted, right? <laughs> Doesn't seem to be doing well with it either, you know? <laughs> this guy in the blue shirt might be experiencing, you know, a blue screen of death at any point. <laughs> and what about the women woman in the back, uh, or sorry, man in the back, he's also kind of working on the data that, that was previously transmitted. What about the woman in the red shirt in the middle? I'm sensing a man in the, woman in the middle attack here. She's clearly sniffing the other person's data, isn't she? <laughs> it's 
that's what I would call a woman in the middle attack, right? <laughs> anyway, moving on. Tip number five. Is more always better? It usually is. But adding more bartenders to your bar doesn't always help. I mean, 2.4 gigahertz frequency is pretty crowded already. And if you try cramming more and more access points, it may not be a fantastic idea. Think of 2.4 gigahertz as a clumsy bartender. It takes a lot of space, and adding more of those clumsy bartenders doesn't always make sense. Same thing with Wi-Fi. You need to reuse your frequency where you can. So then 5 gigahertz frequency, especially if you're, if you're able to use all the channels, it's like fast, super agile bartenders that can work. You know, a lot of those guys can work in the same space. And this is why, in many cases, you need to disable 2.4 gigahertz radios to make the network more effective. It's, it's very counterintuitive, but that's the way it is. <coughs> then there's the whole placement of the access points in general. How, how does that affect my performance? What's wrong with this picture? <coughs> yeah, I mean, channel assignment is decent, but it's a hallway placement, exactly. So, so APs placed in hallways, causing you know, a lot of the APs to hear the other APs, causing code channel interference, which is the worst enemy of Wi-Fi. The worst enemy of Wi-Fi is usually not your microwave ovens. It's not Bluetooth. It's your own Wi-Fi hurting your own Wi-Fi. Code channel interference. So instead of placing APs in the hallways, whenever you can, I know, I know it's always not possible, but whenever you can, Place the APs in the rooms to avoid code channel interference. So in, in short, this is, this is what it's all about. So adding access points isn't always the solution to more capacity. If you do not have free channels available, adding an access point will reduce the throughput of your network. Adding an access, access point if you don't have free channels it doesn't increase anything. It reduces. It adds overhead, reduces your da data transfer capabilities. And that's in part because there's always some overhead included in the 802.11 protocol, also known as how Wi-Fi works. So just like in a bar, you need to wait for your turn, you need to mix the drink, you need to pay for the drink, and you know, there's good behavior like how are you and good thank you, kind of equal to probe request, probe response in Wi-Fi. So there's always some of this. Much of this can never be erased from the equation, but much of it can be minimized. We can make the whole purchasing process, the drink mixing process, more efficient. So for a bar, although you might be charging $10 for a mojito and $5 for a beer. The beer is a much better business if you want to scale the business. The problem with mojitos is it takes ages to fix those drinks, right? And mixing a complex drink eats up your, what's called your usable airtime in Wi-Fi. So I'm sure a lot of you know this. So the more SSIDs you have in your network, the more complex mojitos you are fixing. The more channels, more, more access points on the same channel, the more overhead you have. And this, uh, the percentages there mean how much of your airtime is only consumed by management traffic. You didn't even transfer any data yet. This is your management traffic overhead. Kudos to Andrew van Nash, uh, aka Revolution Wi-Fi, for, uh, for this table and his SSID calculator. Check it out, it's, a, it's an app you can download on your phone and uh, it calculates the amount of overhead based on these variables. So the more drinks, the more complex the drinks, the more bartenders in the same space, the more useless management traffic is created. All right, a couple of quick uh, pointers about spectrum analysis, which 
basically is what spectrum analysis does is detect interference and help you combat against interference. So really, uh, what can interfere with Wi-Fi? A few examples here, uh, Bluetooth, radar, even GSM networks uh, to, to some extent, baby monitors, wireless cameras, jammers, you know, you name it. And there's different kinds of tools to fight the interference. Your access points have built in uh, spectrum analyzers probably. And then there's, you know, site survey tools and, and standalone spectrum analyzers. Your APs are great just like they are great at 24-7 monitoring and spectrum analysis, th the thing is they are up in the ceiling and sometimes the interference, ha or in many cases it happens at the floor level. So having something at hand that you can also take to the floor level at times can be handy in addition to your uh, you know, spectrum analyzer enabled APs. There's really two types, uh, again, external and what's built into the AP. So, if you want to understand like what's going wrong with the spectrum, just try to figure out first from the spectrum analysis what is what is Wi-Fi, what what is normal Wi-Fi traffic, and what is not. And then, if there's non-Wi-Fi interference present, how bad is it? I mean, if there's a little bit, and even if it's loud, that's fine as long as your whole channel is not blocked. If the if the duty cycle of the interferer if the severity of it is bad, then you have, a, of course, a problem. And often, interference sources come and go. Let's say, you know, wireless video cameras might be transmitting every now and then. Wireless microphones might be transmitting only every now and then. But then when they do, they block your entire network. At lunchtime, you might have problems because all the 10 microwave ovens get fired up at the same time. So it's not always on. Even if you, you know, try to analyze the spectrum now, you may find nothing, but an hour later you might, might find it. So if you don't find the problem right away, leave the spectrum analyzer tool running where, you, where the clients are encountering the problems and let it run for a couple of hours and then analyze what was there. Okay, and Wi-Fi, that's actually ancient Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi usually in spectrum analysis looks like these curves and then non-Wi-Fi looks like anything. That's a video, video transmitter right there. I do recommend, uh, if, you're, if you haven't studied this, just, just get the basics. It, spectrum analysis is one, one thing that you know, some people consider rocket science, but it's actually super, super simple. Compared to packet analysis, this is like, you, know, you can learn most of, most of uh, spectrum analysis in one hour by just watching you know, videos in the internet and, and looking at the signatures and playing with, with one yourself. So just to illustrate, that's what a periodic interferer would look like uh, in your spectrum analyzer waterfall view. So you can see these transmissions every now and then with high utilization. So just a few questions that you might ask yourself before acting. We're getting short on time, so we're moving forward. Tip number eight is, you know, it might be a good idea to verify what you've done. I mean, this, in terms of setting up a bar, this is what you would expect, right? So, so you know, you tell your construction guys, do this. You, maybe you send them 3D images of, of what you want, and then it ends up, you know, being some, something like this. Doesn't look quite finished. Yeah, but then, you know, we, that's how we understood the specification. And you're opening the bar the next day. That's kind of the same as not performing a, a site survey once your network has been deployed. And even, even when you perform a site survey, make sure that your access points have been turned on and they are in full operational mode so that you actually understand that it works properly. But then there's the claim that, you know, site survey just, it just slows down my, my sales process. And it does, but again, think of the circle. What do you want to be doing? Saving time up front or chilling out later? In terms of site survey, there's different phases uh, where you can do site surveys. People call, you know, maybe incorrectly, the simulation or network planning or, or dis predictive designs predictive site surveys, but it, it's not a predictive site survey. You're not really there. You're just making a simulation. But anyway, terminology thing. Um, so 
You can do predictive design, highly recommended. Then you can do what's called AP on a stick. So have an AP and go out there on the field, measure that your predictive was actually right. You could do post-deployment site surveys, which if there's one type of site survey walkthrough that you always should do, it's the post-deployment site survey. So without it, without the post-deployment site survey, you risk running with this. So if there's one site survey type you, that you absolutely need, it is the post-deployment. So this is what I developed a few years ago. And uh, my friend Steven Heinzius, who wears an Aruba bag, but works for Cisco, he, he fine-tuned it uh, after that. Anybody seen the survey happiness scale before? No, good. So, if you haven't done any site surveys, really simple rule of thumb. Jim Carrey is angry, very angry, okay? If you've done your post-deployment site surveys, he's already much happier. If you've also done a predictive design or simulation, he's thrilled. And if you add, you know, access point on a stick surveys, you know, nothing could be better, right? If your customer doesn't understand this, then, then you know, I, I don't know what's, what's going to get through. And there's another way to look at this. I call it the Richard Gere scale. You know Richard Gere? The guy from Pretty Woman? So if you don't do side service, it's OK. Post deployment, <laughs> still OK. Predictive. Yeah. The man with one facial expression. <laughs> And there's one, okay, gear used to be, you know, the thing in the 90s, but who's today's Richard Gear? Paris Hilton. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's fine. I'm still all right. Yeah, no problem. She's cool. She doesn't care. Anyway, where was I? Slightly off topic. Okay, all these different kinds of surveys. You know, there's people, people make also survey, site surveys sound very, very complex, right? There's these predictive surveys, passive surveys, active surveys. This is all, all nice and fancy, but the deal is just fire up a site survey tool, connect your adapters, and it will do most of this automatically. What you need to do is click on the map. So don't be stuck with like, oh, the terminology is so hard, or I, I need to be a really hardcore expert. No, you don't. Forget about it. Plug in the adapters, fire up the software, and go. If, if you may, uh, then send it to your friend for, like, did I do this right? That's all you need. Then, to get to high capacity Wi Fi, which was, you know, the bar full of people, unfortunately, there needs to be some math or at least some requirement specification involved. So, when it comes to calculating capacity, of course, the number of dev client devices is very important. The more devices you have, the more capacity it will require. Maybe the more APs you need, the more you need to fine tune it. Where are the clients located is pretty important. You may not need capacity throughout your site, but in some selected location. In an auditorium, you'll have 400 client devices or, or 1,000, but then all across your school, you know, less than that for sure. And then it's important whether the customers are drinking beer, wine, or shots. So what kind of applications are being run on the devices? As discussed, it's a bit different if, you have, if everybody is streaming high-definition YouTube all the time compared to you know, people just doing their emails every now and then. And then there's the cl different client types. We talked about number of spatial streams. You remember multi-user MIMO, all that fun stuff. It just needs to be taken to, into account somehow. So define how many users you have and what kind of devices uh, they are having. I just randomly chose a, a, a screenshots from a random site survey planning tool to be presented here. Might be ours. Um, but even if you don't have to do any math, just figure out the requirements first. Figure out how many client devices, who's using them, how are they using them. And my friend Andrew 
often even when he does his first site visit, which is more like a sales call or, or post, you know, he just got the sale, he goes and he actually talks to the end users of the network as well at the same time. He stops people on the hallway like, how, how do you use your network? What, what do you do with your network? Just to get a good understanding on what devices and how do they operate. And with this, he figures out how thirsty the people are in the bar. So what kind of applications are being run by the users typically? And how frequently those applications are used. Remember, not every client is operating at full speed all the time. And then there's different kinds of tools to calculate the, the need for capacity. Uh, I refer to Andrew all the time, but he has made this pretty good Excel-based calculator, which you, know, you set in a ton of parameters and it spits out the number of APs that are required. And then we have a, a map-based solution where you put in pretty much the same info, but it gives you the placement of the APs, like a suggestion for the placement and, and the number of APs and the configuration, stuff like that. So different options. The Excel-based one is free, so I highly recommend to check it out. Ours is not, except you know, if you want to evaluate whatnot. And then there's this, how much time do we have? We still have time. There's this whole process for designing high capacity Wi-Fi and people have their own processes and whatnot, but at least follow roughly so something like this in terms of steps when you're designing your network if you need it to work for a lot of customers. So it's like just setting up a bar, just like setting up a bar, you know, you need to figure out the business need and, and technical requirements, what kind of infrastructure, things like that. Okay? And then the last tip is, you know, it's Wi-Fi, so it's pretty complex and, and evolving all the time, so you might want to try to learn more. So for example, um, there's this upcoming standard, 802.11ax, and uh, I'm sure there's been talks here about that as well. I, I, I don't know, because I've been at the booth, but um, Jack Lukaszewski from Aruba works at the CTO's office, he's a VP, and he, uh, Eldad from his team who has been designing the modern 802.11 standards, they are joining uh, us for a, for an ECHO Hub webinar, um, I think next month or the month after. So I would recommend joining, joining the webinar. Go to uh, ECAHAU, e -K -A -H -A -U com and training and then sign up for the webinar and we'll be you know, talking about 802.11ax and, and where the industry is going with Chuck. Um, and then, of course, you can learn more at our booth as well regarding come talk about the technology, stuff like that. There's a lot of books, you know all this. And I would like to emphasize Twitter. Go on Twitter, see how it works, and learn more about Wi-Fi there. And before we wrap up, maybe we could get some kind of visual understanding on the, uh, on the airtime utilization. We, we talked a lot about, you know, what is airtime and how does it work. So let's try and see if we can, actually can anybody see any of this? Not really well. But we'll, we're going to try out anyway. Uh, come closer if you cannot see. Just, just feel free to walk, walk towards the, uh, the screen. So what I'll do is try to make kind of a demonstration on the airtime and its importance. Let's see if I can get there, actually. Here we go. Gonna close this out. And so I have randomly chosen just any random site survey planning tool that we're going to use. It just happens to be Echo How this time. And this is actually, uh, it's something we haven't released yet, so you're also getting a sneak preview of our upcoming version. Um, and I, what I'm going to do is first illustrate the importance 
of importing the correct map, but then we'll quickly go into the actual airtime utilization and how that plays a role in the design of Wi-Fi networks. Just give me a second here. Or am I? If I'm not, we get 15 more minutes of coffee. So how many of you, while we wait, how many of you are actually doing some kind of capacity planning for Wi-Fi network these days? Quite many. And what do you use as a method? Ekahau? Anything else? Air magnet. Thermograph. Hmm? Thermograph. Thermograph, yeah. And anybody use the Excel-based calculator from Andrew? Scott does. A couple of others. OK, very good. So this is just one way to do it. Um, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to bring in a map. And, and here's the difference between uh, you know, CAD drawings and non-CAD drawings. So what I'm going to bring in is a CAD drawing. And if I did not have a CAD drawing, we would need to manually draw the walls of the building and, and you know, set the scale manually. And when you're setting the scale, whatever you're doing, Setting the scale is kind of the most fundamental step in Wi-Fi network planning. If you set the scale using a doorway, and you know, instead of three feet, you put four feet, you just made an error of 33%. And you know, that will be across the board for your design. So instead of 100 access points, you might end up with 133 APs unnecessarily, or 66 APs while you actually needed 100. So make sure the scale is set correctly. So first thing that's good about CAD drawing is, is it has you know, availability for different views to the drawing. This is a bit cluttered and it has text and margins and all that stuff, but the, uh, the CAD designers were friendly enough to also have a cleaner uh, layout to the drawing so we can immediately use that. So we don't need to get all the clutter in there. And the next thing is also we can if it was very messy, we could just disable some of the lines from being drawn in the, in, the, uh, in the drawing. But the most important thing is that we don't need to draw the walls anymore. We just select the layers that are included in the CAD drawing, such as this one is windows. You can see the blue, blue colors, those are the windows, and we're going to associate, let's say, a 3 or 1 dB uh, ma material with those. So we need to still choose kind of make a correlation between the Wi-Fi uh, absorbing materials and the materials in the CAD drawing. That's all you need to do. So I'm going to do elevator shafts and mark whatever is important for the Wi-Fi design purposes. Doors are pretty important as well, right? You can see the blue doors there. And how do we want the doors in our Wi-Fi design? Closed, exactly. Luckily, although they look ugly in this drawing, uh, the tool automatically closes the doors for you, so you don't need to worry, worry about that. Just associate the material. Then I'm going to put exterior walls, because that's pretty important. It's a brick wall, so heavy attenuation. And then, finally, the interior walls, just associate them with, with uh, drywall. So for this purpose, too, or for this purpose, it's important to go on site if possible and knock on some you know, walls, because it makes a huge difference whether it's concrete or drywall for the number of access points and their placement as well. And as you can see, the scale is automatically derived because the CAD drawing has that information. So I'm just going to hit import. And for a while, uh, it will be crunching numbers and uh, kind of simplifying the whole drawing. CAD drawings are extremely complex. For example, one wall segment in a CAD drawing can consist of 10 different walls right next to one another. So it kind of takes its time to clean up the whole, whole thing and then spits out. Like drawing this kind of stuff will take you some time. So try to get the CAD drawing so you don't need to draw any of that. So that's the wall structure and of course then we can start uh, building the network with the uh, brand new shiny, I don't know, Aruba 335s. Those are AC, right? So, and as you can tell, of course, looking at the signal strength map, you can see the signal strength. And this is why you want to do careful Wi-Fi planning. You can see how far the signal goes along the corridor 
but it stops right at the elevator, which is next to the AP here on the bottom right. So consider the building materials as you're doing your design, okay? And of course, with this, we, it would be really easy to make a design that fulfills your coverage needs, right? We would just place a few access points in the hallways here and there. You know, keep adding them. I'm just going to do a bad design here. We talked about, you know, placing APs in the hallway, so that's what I'm going to do. I, won't, I don't have the met aluminum foil, though, to wrap the APs around, but, uh, you know. Uh, okay, so here we have a design that still, I think this probably meets kind of the, you know, signal strength requirements. And I do apologize, I, my poor laptop is about to be changed, so it takes a, takes a few seconds to calculate. So yeah, looks, looks phenomenal in terms of coverage, right? <laughs> So uh, this is a great network then, no? Well, first of all, all the access points are in the same channel in this plan. And of course, if you turn on ARM, it will do a good job at assigning the channels. But let's see, if we forgot the APs on the same channel and we turn it on and we didn't turn on ARM, what would happen? So for that, we need to understand how many client devices are in the environment. And what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to say there's, there's a few hundred client devices in this building, so I'm, I'm going to draw an area and say, you know, how many client devices in this area. And I'm going to mark the entire building first. So here we go. Just draw an area for, for what it's worth. And, and then I could... I'm just going to say for coverage needs, uh, voice over Wi-Fi is good. And then I'm going to put, mm, say, 100 smartphones and 100 laptops, 3x3 three three and 2x2. Two two. So multi or uh, MIMO capable still both. So yeah, 200 devices, not, not much traffic there. But then I'm going to say hypothetically, let's say we had an auditorium somewhere here that had more devices than that. So I'm going to draw, draw a new area and kind of say, mm, this area actually has 75 of both, so much higher concentration of continuously transmitting devices, right? 150 devices total. So that's, that's a lot of traffic in that area. So what do you think? Is this network, how well is it going to be able to... Uh, cope with all this. It's a decent number of devices in a, in a fairly small area. Let's look at airtime utilization. So, because that's really what it's all about. The signal strength was good, but how utilized is the RF air? Remember those guys taking turns, right? So, it's, yeah, it looks pretty red, and red means bad. That much we know about the, these, uh, these tools, right? So how much, actually, of airtime are we using now? Let's look at one, just one spot on the map. 383% of airtime being utilized. So there's no way all of those client devices in this location would be utilized. But that's 383% on 2.4. And the tiny text below says, actually, 5 gigahertz is pretty good. It only has 80% utilization. So why did most of my clients associate on 2.4 gigahertz? Hint, we had identical power on both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz radios. So thus, for most of the clients, just because how signal propagates, most of the clients tend to gravitate to the strongest available signal, which in this case is 2.4, because it just travels further or, or is, is received uh, at higher signal strength at the receiver. So, if you set identical powers on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz both, this will happen. So there will be a very uneven distribution of clients unless the clients are more intelligent, such as the iPhone today is. So it prefers the 5 gigahertz. It's smart enough. But, but many of the clients out there are not. So they tend to gravitate towards, towards 2.4, even if you had 
available airtime a lot on five, the clients don't know that, they don't have that information, and the client makes the decision on where to go. So that's why, you know, that's problem number one here. And how do we combat that? One is, of course, band steering between 2.4 and 5. But let's say if we want to do it naturally, we want organic band steering. How do we make that happen? Anybody? So, exactly. Uh, so we reduce the power on the 2.4 gigahertz radios so that they are less attractive to the clients. So let's, let's do that real quickly and see if that makes any difference. I'm going to select all the 2.4 gigahertz radios only, and I'm, I'm going to say for tho all those 2.4 gigahertz radios, instead of 25 milliwatts or whatever dBi, I'm going to say drop it drastically to 2 milliwatts, okay? And let's see what happens. And remember, 383% was our baseline on 2.4 when we started. Still red, but... How red is it? 264%. So we are pushing more now t towards uh, 5 gigahertz. And of course, I will just optimize the channels and use 20 megahertz channel width because we have a fairly dense uh, channel plan. We could use 40 megahertz in this environment probably as well. I'm going to use all the available channels. So instead of having a single channel blanket which was just wrong, now let's optimize the channels as well. And that together with the brand steering, we're already seeing yellow. So it's getting much, much better, right? Things, things are starting to look up. How much do we have now? 67% on 2.4, but only 9% on 5. So, so yeah, yeah, we are, we are already doing good. And then we would start moving the access points uh, to the rooms, but before that, maybe there's something here. And I do apologize that not, not most of you can see it. But maybe there's something here. We have one megabit data rate enabled on 2.4. You remember the guys paying with pennies. We have those guys paying with pennies all the time, and we're not blocking them out of the network. And same on 5 gigahertz, we have 6 megabit minimum data rate. And we have four SSIDs per radio, so we were also mixing very complex drinks. So let's see if that actually has an impact to the network. I'm going to look, take a more closer look at 2.4 gigahertz frequency only, and even smaller text. So you just have to trust me on this one. But we have 30% management frames. So management frames are eating up 30% of the airtime in this network at that given spot. 30%, which we could use for data, but now we're wasting it on management traffic. Actually, we have 32% of data, 30% of management. So 30% crap. 32% substance, kind of like my presentation, actually. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so uh, to reduce that, let's try to reduce the management traffic. So I'm going to say, instead of one megabit uh, data rate, I'm going to say minimum data rate of 12 megabits on both 2.4 and 5, and I'm going to say two SSIDs per radio instead of four, so I do some uh, whatever tricks you do with the VLANs and, and, and all that fancy stuff and recalculate, and hey, it's actually starting to look very, very green. So what happened with our management traffic? Was 30% before, now 2%. That's the impact you have when you raise the data rates, the minimum data rates, and you reduce the number of SSIDs from 30% wasted air time to 2% wasted air time. Okay. And after that, we could do some more, you know, band steering, for example, uh, start sliding, at least attempting to slide more clients towards 5 gigahertz and less towards 2.4, and kind of fine tune the network to perfection. That's all I'm saying. Prepare for the high capacity that will be there in your network. And it's a perfect time for my uh, alpha version of the tool to crash. So with that, I think we're done. And, and we're 15 minutes early. Thank you so much, guys, for joining. And do remember to vote, OK?